Now, Sharon Newland, um, a Yale professor uh, who's written extensively uh, on this area, uh, tells us that near-death experiences are simply hallucinations. In fact, he, he doesn't even uh, understand what the current fuss about these experiences is. Twenty years ago, he says they would have been hallucinations, and today uh, he feels that the, they can be dismissed uh, as hallucinations. Nevertheless, when you look at these experiences and compare them to other types of hallucinations, you find that they're strikingly different. You don't see a lot of the paranoid uh, ideation that you see with drug overdoses. You don't see the aggressive elements you might see with PCP uh, overdose. The patients are not disoriented. They're not delirious. They're completely oriented. They say, I know where I am. I know who I am. They simply perceive themselves from a different perspective. So they're quite aware of their surroundings. They're quite oriented. You don't see the kind of somatic or olfactory hallucinations that you might see with LSD intoxication or schizophrenic hallucinations. And basically, these patients aren't crazy. So there's no question from numerous studies in the literature, it's quite easy to distinguish a near-death experience uh, from all the other types of hallucinations. <laughs> and so if we're going to consider them that, we must consider them to be a specific subset Furthermore, for example, Dr. Schnaper at the Maryland Shock Tra Trauma Unit, he does believe that these experiences are simply a subset of intensive care unit psychosis. And yet, even his own, own research shows that these experiences are a very distinct and unique subset. They are just simply unlike any previously described psychotic or hallucinatory experiences uh, in the literature. Post-cardiac psychosis, for example, uh, is usually a denial of reality. The patient denies they had cardiac surgery, they said I was on the floor having an orthopedic procedure done to me, or they say I wasn't in the hospital at all, I was at home having coffee with my wife. Uh, these experiences completely uh, understand and accept reality. Uh, in fact, as we're going to get to in a minute, uh, they usually quite accurately describe what's happening to them while they're comatose. Now, after I heard uh, several of this kind of experience uh, from the patients uh, I resuscitated, uh, we decided we would do our own study of these experiences at Seattle Children's Hospital. And I'm very proud that I was funded by the National Cancer Institute for this. Uh, I'm, to my knowledge, the only publicly funded uh, study of near-death experiences or any kind of death-related visions. And when you have a study uh, like ours, uh, it's best to get the most mainstream and normal and uh, thoughtful uh, scientists uh, in the hospital on board, and we certainly did. Uh, Don Tyler is head of uh, anesthesia uh, at the Seattle Children's Hospital at the time. Uh, Jerry Milstein uh, at the time was uh, chairman of the Department of Child Neurology. And we worked uh, with a variety of different uh, researchers around the country. Uh, Vernon Nevy, uh, director of neuropsychiatry at the U. Uh, Bill Sardaly uh, from the University of Montana. And we decided we would take a very simplistic view of these experiences. I've already alluded to you that these experiences, by their very nature, seem to conjure up all sorts of philosophical and spiritual dilemmas. We actually had a very simple question about near-death experiences. We simply wanted to know, when do these experiences occur? Do they happen, in fact, when the person, uh, these children say it happened when they die? Or are these experiences secondary falsifications after the fact? I'm going to go into the secondary falsification theory for a little bit because I think that that's the one that most medical scientists and physicians feel is the proper explanation of these experiences. Uh, we all know that coma is never complete, that sometimes patients wax and wane uh, in and out of consciousness. Um, they have a variety of different medications that they're treated with. Um, they can hear little pieces. Uh, perhaps they have religious uh, preconceptions. Uh, for example, the case of Patrick Nicholson where he says, uh, I saw Jim Pearson with his head in his hands. And an amateur uh, photograph at the scene uh, documented uh, exactly the scene uh, as um, Patrick described it. 
maybe somehow he had access to that photograph, uh, even though his parents say he, he never saw it, uh, that he was, uh, you know, uh, comatose in the hospital uh, uh, when uh, that uh, photograph was run in the newspaper. But maybe somehow he heard a little piece of a conversation, and then they weave it together into a coherent theory. Well, <laughs> actually, that sounds kind of far-fetched to me in many ways, except for one powerful, convincing argument, and that is that it doesn't disturb any of our conventional accepted ideas of how consciousness and memory work. <coughs> and the gods of neurology uh, that I worship, uh, Plum and Posner, uh, tell us that coma wipes clean the slate of consciousness. And so I think it's very seductive uh, to believe that these experiences don't occur in comatose patients uh, who have fixed and dilated pupils, but are in fact some sort of fabrication, unconscious, of course, no one thinks that these kids are making this sort of thing up, but a fabrication after the fact. And um, boy, Ron Siegel, you know, a genius, um, one of the brightest people in hallucinations uh, in the country, uh, writes very um, uh, persuasively on this issue. Susan Blackmore, one of the leading researchers from England, uh, also uh, is of this opinion, and uh, Will William Calvin from the University of Washington. And I think he summarizes this uh, line of thinking the best. Patients who confabulate tell the best story that they are able to construct from the data that's available to them, and they think it to be true. Here's another great Seattle thinker. Uh, this is Gary Larson. This sums up the confabulation. Uh, you see up above here, the surgeons uh, having a little fun with their patient. And then after the fact, she's telling us uh, for the benefit of the talk show, I saw a light at the end of the tunnel. In contrast, a handful of theoreticians in this area believe that these are, in fact, real-time events at the point of death. And we base this primarily on the similarities, as I'm going to get to uh, later in the talk, between these experiences and the known phenomena of right temporal lobe, well, dysfunction, is uh, what uh, most uh, of the other uh, thinkers in this area believe. Dan Carr, I believe, is the first uh, person uh, to uh, suggest that when people die, they have essentially temporal lobe seizures and have a variety of spiritual experiences uh, to ease them into death. Michael Persinger uh, from uh, the, uh, Canada, he writes a brilliant paper called The Religious Experience as an Artifact of Right Temporal Lobe Dysfunction. So again, the title of that article reflects his underlying philosophical bias, um, that these experiences real time as they may be, are dysfunctions and artifacts. Uh, interestingly enough, I've added very little uh, to those uh, thinkers. I've just put it in a, uh, a different framework. I've said uh, perhaps uh, these experiences represent the normal function of our temporal lobes when we die. Now, our research questions were very simple. What memories do children have after surviving cardiac arrest? How do these memories compare to what, what we culturally call near-death experiences? And then we use the control for them. What do really sick kids who are treated with lots of drugs, who have a lack of oxygen to their brain, who think they're going to die, who have scary diseases requiring innovation and ventilation in a modern intensive care unit, what memories do they have? after such an experience. So we were willing to accept any memory that a child referred to nearly dying as being a near-death experience for the purposes of our study. If they told us they were home having tea uh, with their mother, if, if they told us that spooky monsters were chasing them down the hallway, uh, we considered that to be a near-death experience uh, for the purpose uh, of our study. And here are the, the critically ill patients uh, that we studied. We studied half of them retrospectively. Um, we started our study in 1982, so we went back to 1975 and uh, gathered all survivors of cardiac arrest at Seattle Children's Hospital. And then we studied the same group prospectively uh, through uh, to 1992. And uh, this is near death by anyone's criteria. As I'm sure you all are aware, it's very bad to have your heart stop beating. Uh, 
really flat liners notwithstanding, even in a hospital setting, most people uh, whose heart stops beating either die or uh, do not uh, survive to tell us about it. And then this is the type of control patient that we studied. My favorite is epiglottitis. We studied 24 children with epiglottitis, a uh, disease which we felt would really help uh, us to understand if these experiences are fantasies or confabulations. After all, epiglottitis occurs in four and five and six year old children, a sense uh, which is a fantasy prone years. A sense of impending doom is the textbook description of what a child feels when they have epiglottitis. And yet, given uh, the care in our intensive care unit, uh, these patients do not die. We looked at elective surgery to see if anesthetic agents um, cause this experience. And I will have to tell you uh, that our bias was, uh, when we started our study, that the anesthetic agent halophane caused these experiences. We felt this was probably a dissociative uh, effect uh, to uh, either halophane or a combination of halophane uh, and the other drugs uh, that we use uh, in innovation uh, and resuscitation. Uh, the issue of drug overdoses and are these experiences uh, simply endorphins uh, in the brain at the point of death comes up. So we looked at a, at a wide number of different types of drug overdoses to see what experiences that they describe. And here's the kinds of questions we asked. I'm in private practice. I frequently say to children things like, uh, do you have a monkey in your ear? They say yes. <laughs> That's not dramatic proof of a race of tiny monkeys living in children's ears. <laughs> not at all. That, that just says that children particularly want to please powerful adults in their lives. We are quite aware of that. We work from a strict research protocol and uh, which we were only permitted to ask 16 questions. And this is the type of question that we were permitted to ask. What do you remember about being unconscious? Or in younger children, you know, uh, you heard as I asked Jamie Antonin, what do you remember about being in the hospital? What happened to you when you were asleep? Uh, you know, this kind of uh, open-ended question in which uh, we felt uh, we could reinforce them for any type of answer uh, that they were willing to give us. We did not uh, endlessly ask them over and over again, did you see the light, you know, etc. <laughs> <laughs> and our results were extraordinary. Um, they're so extraordinary uh, that I have to tell you uh, that they have now been uh, replicated by two studies, one from the University of Utrecht uh, using our research design in adults uh, that found uh, similar results, and a similar, uh, somewhat related study uh, done at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, we found, in fact, that virtually every patient that we resuscitated from nearly dying had some memory of the experience, a fragment usually, whereas none of our control patients described anything about the time they were in the hospital. It was our control patients who fit within the modern neuroscientific thinking. We know that trauma wipes out your short-term memory, and they would just say, I don't remember being in the hospital. I don't remember being in the intensive care unit. It's fascinating to contemplate that the closer a patient comes to death, the more likely they are to have a memory of the experience. And not only that, but the memories they described were invariably of this extremely transcendent or spiritual nature. 